criticism of Israel is now being criminalized. Uh, it's becoming illegal to say certain things. And that criminalization of um, critical things of Israel, it's actually spread to places in the left. So if you look at the British Labour Party, they are expelling one member after another member after another member for saying anything critical of Israel. Uh, for example, just two days ago, a leading member of the British Labour Party was suspended because he said, I think a lot of this anti-Semitism hysteria is being created by the Israeli consulate. Well, of course it's in part being created by the Israeli consulate. But for saying something which is just transparently true, because it was perceived as criticism of Israel, he was suspended. And that's within Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. <coughs> so it's a level of uh, criminalization and censorship which is happening everywhere. And the question is, why? And my opinion on that is the following. I'm obviously much older than most of the people in this room, probably. Uh, I'm older than everybody, but much older than most of the people in this room. There was a time when the Israeli point of view dominated public opinion. And it was impossible for critics of Israeli conduct to get any hearing in the public. <coughs> Israel, the Israeli point of view, controlled public opinion, in part because the Israelis were very effective in their propaganda organization, and in part because of, in places like Denmark, a certain amount of guilt over what happened to Jews in World War II. So because of the guilt and the effectiveness of Israeli propaganda, Israel completely controlled perceptions of the Middle East in general <coughs> and Israel and its neighbors in particular not just the Palestinians, that's relatively recent. It was more Israel's relationship with Egypt, Israel's relationship with Jordan, Israel's relationship with Lebanon. Israel controlled all the public perception. In recent years, public perception has changed radically. Israel has not been able Israel has not been able to deceive the entire public anymore about its conduct. After what was called, in 1982, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, then 1987, the first intifada, the nonviolent Palestinian uprising against the occupation, and then soon thereafter, the 2006 war in Lebanon, the 2007-8 war, they weren't wars, massacres in Gaza, then 2014, and this succession of really grotesque <coughs> massacres of a defenseless population, here referring to Gaza, Israel has no longer been able to control public perception. In fact, even in the United States, within the Democratic Party, there has been a sharp increase in criticism of Israel. And so, because <coughs> Israel can no longer control public opinion, it can no longer rely on its propaganda to win over public opinion. It's now resorted 
to try to criticize and, excuse me, try to criminalize any criticism of Israel. They're trying to stop public opinion from expressing itself because now that public expression is very critical of Israel. They didn't need the criminal laws in the past because they controlled public opinion. But now they need to criminalize criticism of Israel because it's the only way to stop public opinion from expressing itself. But is it so, spreading? Yes, it's definitely it's a genuine problem because, as I said, it's actually spread to places like the Labour Party, where even there, by the way, it's a strange thing, you are much freer in the United States than the Democratic Party, of all places, in the Democratic Party, which was 150% pro-Israel. It's much easier to criticize Israel in the U.S. Democratic Party than it is now in the British Labour Party because of this hysteria that's been whipped up against Jeremy Corbyn. You the interesting question where we'll probably totally disagree is that is a difficulty. I live in the United States. I didn't like Obama. I don't like Obama. I never will like Obama. Obama is a white person who happened to have black skin. <laughs> you know, he's, it was a cur you know, curious freak of nature. He's white, uh, and he happens to have black skin. I didn't like him. It's impossible in the United States, impossible to criticize Obama in the black community. He did absolutely nothing for black people. Nothing. You look at his cabinet, his main officials around him. Remember George Bush, George Bush had uh, Condoleezza Rice, he had, um, oh, his name just slipped my oh, mind, the Secretary oh, of State, Colin Powell. Colin Powell. <laughs> Obama had nobody of uh, African descent. He had Eric Holder, the Attorney General, and uh, whatever her name is, I forgot, the National Security Council. That was it. No. You can't criticize Obama in the black community. Whenever I try to, I already feel, in front of an African American, I, I already feel they want to kill me. <laughs> you know? Uh, and that's just a reality. It's a sensitivity. Just to, and uh, I think it's very tough. Okay. If you're a Muslim, uh, to not get accused of being anti-Semitic. It's a, it's a hard uh, thing. I think some of the stuff, I'll say it on camera, you know, uh, some of the stuff uh, Nakhdi Hassan has been doing lately has been disgusting. He's been uh, collaborating, he collaborated with Jonathan Friedland from The Guardian writing something about anti-Semitism and, and uh, Islamophobia and attacking uh, the Labour Party. Uh, and he does it, you know, in order to get his, uh, uh, in order to get his support in the Jewish community and in uh, British elite circles. A complete sellout. And I've told him, yeah, I, I've, I've written him that, you know, I don't like Muslims who all of a sudden start parading their concern about anti-Semitism. First of all, it's not a problem. <laughs> it isn't. I mean, it's just ridiculous. In, the, in Britain, anti-Semitism, before Corbyn came along, the two leaders, the two leaders of the Labour Party were, oh God, my memory, Ralph, what was, this is terrible, my memory for names is just going down the tube. Gordon Brown? Excuse me, no, uh, the brothers. Um, oh, yeah. Excuse me? Yeah, the Miliband brothers. They're both Jewish. The, the leader and the competitor were both Jewish. 
the idea that there's a problem of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, but Mehdi Hassan, he wants to, you know, gain support among the... Well, it's not to talk about Mehdi Hassan right now, but mm -hmm. I think you got the point, uh, over. What I want to talk about now is about the information source that you actually... Well, if you... Yes, I think that's an important If point. I want to know about anti-Semitism, if I want to know about what is happening actually in Israel and Palestine, mm -hmm. then let's just take a look at your recent book. You just wrote the book uh, Gaza and Inquest into the it's a uh, Macedon, mm -hmm. and in the first half of the book, you actually use many uh, different. Uh, you quote many reports: Amnesty International, the Goldstone Report, Human Rights Watch, UN reports, and so on. But around half uh, into the book, we see that Richard Goldstone chooses to retreat his report, and the next half of the book, you actually start attacking every single one. So Amnesty International, you said it cannot be seriously doubted that Amnesty International's report on Operation Protective Edge lacked objectivity and professionalism. They betrayed a systematic bias against Hamas in favor of Israel. And what about Human Rights Watch? You say they, are, they basically sat on the sideline after Protective Edge and so on. So the question is, who can I trust nowadays? Or where can I get my information? Because you say there's no rise in anti-Semitism. And I say, well, am I only supposed to read your work? That was the easy answer. <laughs> <laughs> but you anticipated it. Um, yeah, that's a fair question. Uh, who do you trust? And it is correct to say that at least after Operation Protective Edge in July, August 2014, the human rights organizations their record was an abomination because everybody got scared for the reasons which you have already referred to, that the pro-Israel organizations became extremely aggressive in trying to stop criticism and they had succeeded to a large extent and we have to be honest about that. After, most of you will not remember, but apparently you do, or you read the book so you're familiar with the facts, after Operation Protective Edge in 2008-9, from December 27th to January 17th, 2000, December 26th, 27th, uh, to January 17th, 2000, uh, 2008-9 to January 17, 2009. After that, it was a, for its time, it was a horrendous massacre that Israel inflicted on Gaza. Uh, the South African jurist, <coughs> Richard Goldstone, was called upon by the Human Rights Council to investigate what happened during Operation Protective Edge. Now, Richard Goldstone was an unusual choice because he was Jewish, he was a Zionist, his daughter lived in Israel, he was on the board of directors of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he was active in Zionist causes. So, this was something new. A liberal Jew was being called upon by the UN Human Rights Council to investigate Israeli crimes. And surprisingly, he authored, with his three other colleagues, with him in particular, he authored a pretty devastating account of Israeli crimes. The Israelis, as you can imagine, were outraged because you couldn't call Richard Goldstone anti-Semitic. He was a very self-identified Jew. You couldn't call him anti-Zionist. He was a, identified as himself. He identified himself as a Zionist. You couldn't call him anti-Israel. And so you couldn't call him 
anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic, you couldn't call him anti-Zionist, you couldn't call him anti-Israel. Well, if he was none of those things, then the only explanation for what he wrote could only be because it was true. Otherwise, why did he write it? He didn't have any other agenda. He didn't have an anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic agenda. It must have been true. And after Israel realized they couldn't use their usual weapons, calling the person anti-Semite, anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, they tried to destroy him personally. And they did a lot of very ugly things. For example, the South African Jewish community organized to try to prevent him from attending the bar mitzvah of his grandson. The bar mitzvah is in Jewish tradition, the point of transition from being a child to a man, your 13th birthday. And they tried to prevent him from attending. It's my opinion which I can't prove, and I want to make that clear, it's my opinion that they found the dirt on him. Everybody's got skeletons, we say, in their closet. And they blackmailed him. And then he retracted the report. He took it back. He said it was not true what I wrote. And after he did that, everybody else got scared. Because they thought, if you can bring down Goldstone, you can bring me down too. Because I have skeletons in the closet. Everybody's got skeletons in the closet. So after the disaster with Richard Goldstone, the human rights organizations became pretty awful on Israel. From fear. In my opinion, it was mostly fear. The worst, by the way, is the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Fatou Ben Souda. Um, there are several cases before her, and she refuses to investigate any crimes against Israel. And the reason is obvious. She's probably got a lot of skeletons in her closet, and she's very afraid what the Israelis will do. That still leaves the question that you asked, which was a very intelligent question. Then who do you trust? And if you read the book, you will notice that in the chapter on Operation Protective Edge, I depended a lot on the Israeli soldiers. Yeah, all the testimonies and yes. breaking the silence. Yeah. Yes, the Israeli soldiers, a large number of them, not because they loved Palestinians, not because they felt any guilt about what they did. They just frankly spoke about how they carried on in Gaza. And when you read the testimonies, really, even now, I, as I'm speaking now, I get shivers in my spine. It was just really shocking. It was shocking what they did. And it was doubly shocking how, frankly, they described what they did. The way they would just go into neighborhoods, rope off the neighborhood, let's say the equivalent of this room, put up rope, a <coughs> hundred houses, two hundred houses, homes. People live there. In Gaza, it's all they have, their home, because they're refugees. That's where they invest everything, their home. And just bring in the D9, what are called D9 bulldozers, and just flop <coughs> it. There's no war going on. There's no fighting going on. This is not like clearing a path for tanks or clearing the path because you're fearful of snipers? No. It was just wholesale
destruction, rope off, and they describe it. As a matter of fact, I'm not exaggerating, there were so many descriptions, each of them more horrible than the next. I had to write to friends and say, which ones would you eliminate? Because it was too many. As it was, you might recall, it took up like three pages. What I yeah. include, it could have been 20 pages of just these very vivid descriptions. So since I found that I was unable to trust a lot of the human rights organizations, I relied on the testimonies of Israeli soldiers. However, there's a very big but. Israel recognized that those testimonies were a big problem. And so just like they criminalized all criticism of Israel in the Western world, they now start to criminalize breaking the silence. The Israeli organization which recorded the testimonies and they start to call them traitors. It was very interesting that current head of the Israeli human rights organization, Beth Selim, uh, it's the main human rights organization for the occupied Palestinian territories. The guy is, uh, the head of it is named Hagai El Ad. And he's a Harvard trained physicist. He's a very smart guy. And he's very firm. He has, a sci he has a scientist's eye, and he sees all the stuff put out by the Israeli government. It's just pure nonsense. It's garbage. And he was invited to the UN to speak. And then the Israeli ambassador was sitting there. And the Israeli ambassador, when he's speaking to the UN, he has a big smile on his face. And he's saying, isn't this wonderful in Israel? We can criticize. People can criticize us because a guy Elad was there. And then he turned to him in Hebrew. And he said to him in Hebrew, you traitor. You're stabbing us in the back. It took a lot of courage. Because even now in Israel, the issue of <coughs> crushing all dissent critical of Israel. And so when the Israelis attack Gaza next, there won't be a breaking the silence. And it'll be very hard to document yeah. what's happening. Okay. Very hard to document. As I said, I don't want to repeat myself from last night. How many people here were there last night? Okay, so most of you. I'll just briefly make the point I made last night that um, what was remarkable about the latest Human Rights Council report was the first time a human rights organization of a major s stature, it said outright Israel is targeting civilians. It's murdering children. It's murdering journalists. It's murdering uh, medical personnel. It's murdering disabled people. No human rights organization. They didn't use the word murder, but it was murder. It was people very far away from the separation fence, sitting under a tree, on crutches, double amputees, and they were being targeted by snipers, but very well trained snipers. The reason they were able to do that, this human rights organization, is Israel always uses the excuse, well, Hamas fighters are using Palestinians as human shields. Hamas fighters are sh firing rockets from among civilian population. They were always able to do that because there's a quote-unquote war going on. But this time... <coughs> It was just obviously civilian demonstrators. And there were all these people videotaping what's going on. And so for the first time, because those demonstrations remained overwhelmingly nonviolent, 
There were no Hamas fighters anywhere with weapons. For the first time, a human rights organization was able to say, but everybody knew, if you wanted to know in the past, of course Israel's targeting civilians. But now for the first time, it was documented. And it was documented in a way which was, was really, it was kind of shocking to read it, the descriptions. Um, so that was something new. The trouble was, as I said last night, that documentation was never used. Perfect. Well, before we move on to the Q&A, the last thing I want to ask you about, and that you didn't get a chance to talk about yesterday, what is the deal of the century? And so a lot of people have, of course, been uh, talking about one-state, two-state solutions, and uh, even uh, in head-to-head -head with Mehdi Hassan, you still talked about two-state solutions because you said that's what most nations want. That's where their support lies. But the statistics show recent poll by the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, 53% of the Palestinians prefer the two-state solution, 24% said that they prefer the one-state solution. Is there happening a change right now? Are more people willing to go for a one-state solution? And is the deal of the century going to happen? Uh, I'm not going to answer one part of the question now. I'll answer one part because I want to give a chance to the audience. Yeah. Um, when when uh, Mr. Trump refers to the deal of the century, I think people should pay attention to the word deal. It's a deal. Mr. Trump is, by nature, a real estate developer. And for him, what he calls the deal of the century, and for his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who's the son of another very big real estate developer named Charles Kushner. For them, it's a real estate deal. It's, it has nothing to do with politics as we understand it, or as most people understand it. It's a real estate deal. What does it mean? First of all, the main force behind the real estate deal is not Trump. It's incorrect. It's not Jared Kushner. That's incorrect. It's not Netanyahu. That's incorrect. The main force is Saudi Arabia. The Saudis, for years, have had a quiet relationship with Israel. But they realize they need an open relationship. They need full-scale military cooperation with Israel and with the United States. Because the Saudis, on their own, can't do anything. They can't fight, they can't work, they can't think. They're parasites. So on their own, they can't do anything. Any work they do, they have to import people. You know, for Saudi, work is the four-letter word. So now they have a formidable, or in their minds, a formidable enemy with Iran, and they're looking for the Israelis and the Americans to save them. The one, prov the one obstacle to that open relationship with Israel, the one obstacle has always been the Palestinians. That it's very hard for the Saudis to openly cooperate with Israel unless they can eliminate this nuisance called the Palestinian question. So they are the driving force. They want the open relationship with Israel and the United States. With the United States, they already have the open relationship, but the Palestine question has always been a nuisance to the open relationship with Israel. So they're the driving force. In recent times, say the last year, a new incentive has come for the Saudis because they're hoping if they can eliminate the Palestine question, the Palestine nuisance, then um, 
Mohammed bin Salman, his name will be cleared for the murder of Khashoggi, the German. Uh, but he, this would help rehabilitate his name. As for the other parties to the conflict, uh, Netanyahu, what he would stand to gain is the United States will agree to let him annex what's called the major settlement blocks, which is about 10% of the West Bank. It's the area on what's called the Israeli side of the wall that Israel has built inside the occupied Palestinian territories. It comes to about 9.5% of the West Bank. And that would, for Netanyahu, after the recognition of Jerusalem as the Israeli capital, after the recognition of the Golan Heights, now would be the recognition that the major settlement blocks belong to Israel. That's not an important victory for Netanyahu, because Trump does not command enough moral authority such that if he loses in 2020, which is possible, unlikely, he'll probably win, but if he loses, then everything will go back to what it was before Trump came to power. Uh, the Golan will not be recognized as part of Israel by the U.S. government. Jerusalem will still be an open question. So it's not a big thing for Netanyahu to win U.S. recognition of the settlement blocks. What would be very big for him is an open alliance with Saudi Arabia. Because that would be the end of the Arab League. Uh, there's not much left to the Arab League, I recognize. But this would be the end. Uh, it would now be half of the so-called Arab Muslim world is now fully, openly aligned with Israel. And that would be a historic victory for Israel. As for Trump, Trump, he figures he could probably get some Jewish billionaires to support him in the next election, which is true probably get a few more Jewish votes, not many, because, as I said, Jews in general don't like Trump. Uh, the big thing is for Trump and Jared Kushner, it's a real estate deal. Kushner will have now the whole Gulf as his playground to build skyscrapers. And that's really all he cares about. These are not politicians in the conventional sense. Trump just looks for deals. And when he says deal, he doesn't mean a political deal. He means a real estate deal. And the same thing with Jared Kushner. It's a real estate deal. Um, when President Clinton was in power, uh, he was a sexual predator. He could not resist any woman around him. But he was also a very smart guy. He was a politician. Kushner and Trump, they're real estate predators. They cannot resist, they really can't. They can't resist a real estate deal. And so they see the Gulf and the Saudi Arabia as this kind of virginal territory where they're going to build and build and build. It's just a deal for them because they know that MBS will probably be in power until that 13-year-old over there has already passed away. Um, they know that MBS will be completely indebted to them for the rest of his life because he will have rehabilitated, uh, Trump and Kushner would have rehabilitated him in the U.S. after the Khashoggi disaster and also because the entire ruling elite will love uh, MBS because he ended into an open alliance with Israel. Um, so it is a deal. And the only the Palestinians, they have nothing really much to do with the deal. They're going to give them, how do rich people deal with nuisances? They give them some money to shut up the nuisance. So they figure they'll throw some money at the Gazans, throw some money at the uh, so-called Palestinian Authority, and that will solve the Palestine question. Perfect. Thank you very much.
So uh, what we're going to do now is uh, open up for... Um, I have an educational background in uh, human rights law as well. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you and all these good people in the world. I would like to ask you two questions. The first question is uh, concerning internal matters here in Denmark. And then I would like to ask you about uh, foreign politics, uh, which concerns the, uh, the conflict. And the first question is that we, in the time that has passed now, have seen very radical right-wing parties in Denmark emerging. Not only with the, the party that we talked about earlier, the, the Danish People Party, but also parties which are far more right than that particular party that we just discussed earlier. And in your international experience, how, how would you suggest that we as politicians in Denmark go about stopping and preventing these far radical movements, political parties, from spreading to our societies and to the people of Denmark? That's the first question. And the second question is, um, from a Danish political standpoint, which actions and tools, political measures, would you suggest in order to put pressure on the Israeli occupiers in uh, the Palestinian land in, down in the, in the Middle East? Thank you. Well, the first question is um, what do you do, how do you deal with the far right? And I can't really give you any magic formulas. I can only tell you what seems to me pretty much common political sense. Number one, given your numbers, you can't do very much on your own. You have to form alliances with other groups based on common interests. And until you can form alliances with if not a, minor, a majority, at any rate with enough people that you can have a formidable representation in your political institutions. So the first challenge is you have to break out of your communal ghetto. I noticed when I spoke last night at the Royal Library, I could see, and then I was told afterwards, that 90% of the audience was Muslim or Muslim Arab. Only about 10% were non-Muslim or non-Muslim Arab. That's obviously a problem. The young people recognized it, you know, I talked to them afterwards, but especially at a central institution like the Royal Library, you should have been able to attract more non-Muslim people into the audience. So the first challenge is you have to break out of the ghetto. The second challenge is you have to not confuse the leadership with the rank and file, the ordinary people. There is a leadership which obviously has a political agenda. But as uh, a number of people who I talk to, including I think yourself, when I ask you, how do you account for all the support it gets? Because I was told you have 11 political parties here and that the uh, Danish People's Party got 20% of the vote in the last election, which is very high considering you have 11, 11 political parties. So I asked, what do you, how, does it, how do you account for that support in a society which seems to be unusually fair uh, in its distribution of wealth and privilege? And the answer was fear, or at least one of the answers was the leadership exploits the fear of the people. The leadership is completely cynical. They use fear to try to get support. But that doesn't mean the ordinary people are cynical. They are genuinely fearful. And so you have to not confuse the leadership 
with the people they're attracting. You have to try to win over at least some of that 20%. And as I said earlier, in my opinion, the only way you can possibly persuade them, win over some, not all, there'll be a hardcore you can't win over. But there's still going to be a certain percentage you can win over. And the only way you can do that is by talking to them. Not putting labels on them and saying they're fascists, they are Islamophobes, they are this, they are that. They are ordinary people who are being tricked, exploited, the fancy word is duped by their leadership. And so I think the most important, the best weapon you have on your side is the truth. You have facts on your side. They have some facts on their side, but then you have to try to explain to them the context of the facts. If, as one person told me, there's a large number of elderly Muslim women who don't work for various reasons, and then you try to explain what are the social reasons for that. And there's a hope of winning over a part of that group. Let me give you an example from the United States. So our media now in the United States is very polarized. There is the pro-Democratic Party media and the pro-Trump media. And the main outlet, the main expression of the pro-Trump media is what's called Fox News. Some of you may have heard of it. It's Fox News. And a few weeks ago, Guess who showed up on Fox News? Bernie Sanders. Well, a lot of people in the anti-Trump media how, said, how could you go on Trump's, a pro-Trump, they're racist, they're anti-Semites, they're Islamophobes, they're sexist, they're homophobes. How could you go on? And of course he went on. Because Bernie Sanders thought, I have a message which, if they heard me, because a lot of Trump supporters are workers. A lot of Trump supporters, they don't have health care. A lot of Trump supporters, they can't afford college. So Trump says, I'm for universal health care like Denmark. I'm for free college education like Denmark, and he thinks, if I can talk to them, I could probably win over a lot of them. So of course I'm going to go to Fox News, because that's where a lot of my potential supporters are. They're supporting Trump, not because they're racist, not because they're sexists, not because they're anti-Semites, but because they've been tricked by Trump. They've been fooled. So he goes among them. And actually, if you watch it on YouTube, it was very good. He got a lot of applause. I was kind of surprised myself. A lot of people, and Trump got very angry. He said, why are you having all these anti-Trump people on Fox News? <laughs> yes, he started to attack Fox News. He says, there are more anti-Trump people than Trump people now on Fox News. Uh, and I think that's the attitude you have to have. Yes, you can never convince the leadership. They're completely cynical. They just exploit fear. It's true. But you don't write off the people. The people you have a chance. I'm not going to say with everyone, and I'm not going to even say you're going to win with a majority, but you can win over some by trying to rationally discuss their fear and even be generous by saying, well, you know, that's factually true, what you're saying. That there is a problem amongst, in certain neighborhoods with Muslim crime. It's factually true. There's a problem there. We recognize it's a problem. And we're not afraid to criticize it, you know? 
You try to be honest, try to be fair, and then I think you stand a chance of winning over some, reducing that 20% to 15%, maybe even reducing it to 13%, which would be significant. So those are the two things, in my opinion. One, on your own, you can't do very much. You've got to break out of the ghetto. You've got to figure out a way to talk to the world around you. And number two, you have to feel confidence that you have truth on your side, you have justice on your side, and that not with all, but a certain percentage, if you have a free, open conversation based on good faith, you have a possibility of winning them over, which has basically been what Bernie Sanders has been doing. He's, I think I can win over a lot of Trump's workers who supported him if they hear my message. Uh, so that's what I would say. Thank you. Uh, another question? Israel is this startup nation and of innovation and high tech. And in the case, there was no accountants for the political side of Israel, more of it as a, this innovation system and ecosystem. And this was from Howard, which is one of the most recognized universities in the world. How do you think because you mentioned yesterday that we have to mobilize more, read the reports. How do you think we can mobilize towards these institutions that are like the think tanks of the world to to hold them accountable, to have a more representative um, cases or like research on Israel? Um, because the guy who presented the case to us from he came from Sacramento, and he said, "Well, I know they ignore the political side, but then they went on to say." that there's a threat to the Israeli ecosystem and the high-tech innovation because of the hostile neighbors. So it's very biased. So how do you think we can respond to that? Uh, yeah. Thank you. I wonder if you can just explain me the circumstances one more time. You were attending what kind of course? Uh, as I study entrepreneurship, and we, we just had a guest lecture from Sacramento, mm -hmm. where we had to read this business case uh, from Howard Business School, and mm -hmm. it was for us to learn about innovation ecosystems. And mm -hmm. one of the only ecosystems that's really given, uh, besides Silicon Valley, is actually Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, that's for, for example, there's a lot of German students in my in my master program, and for them, they just see. Well, Tel Aviv, Israel is this great innovation state, mm -hmm. but they don't account for the political aspect to it, mm -hmm. and business forms politics. So how can we make the debate more diverse and, and factual? Um, I would say the answer in that specific case is not so simple, uh, but what I would insist on is to the extent that you believe and you felt it was being conveyed that there was a propaganda element in the presentation that you should exercise your right first to go to the professor then to go to the department, and then go to the, uh, whatever is the responsible official, the dean, and to just say, I have no objection whatsoever to that presentation. He has the right, or she has the right to make that presentation. But I do have a problem with the fact that I felt that that presentation was being used for a political agenda. And that person has the right to that political agenda. However, in the interest of balance and people getting to hear all sides, why don't you invite somebody from Gaza who can give you their side of what a startup nation looks like from the inside? And then let's have all sides heard. I'm not trying to silence everyone, anyone. I just want all sides to be heard. 
And now they may argue that Gaza is not a startup nation, but then you have the right to say that I think that what's going on in Gaza is part of the full picture. That we only got half the picture. We got Israel as a startup nation. How about Israel as a nation that's destroying the people of Gaza? Shouldn't we get that picture also? Uh, because I think there was a political agenda in the presentation. And I would start from that approach. I wouldn't do it on my own. I would try to get other students, try to convince them that you are not trying to suppress speech, and you have to be very strong about that. Everybody has the right to speak. I'm not trying to suppress. But don't you think it would be fair if we can hear all sides? And then I think you can win over a large number of your student, your fellow students, and then have you as a group go to the teacher and then go to the chair of the department and then go to the dean uh, and make it uh, what I think is important. Don't make it a Muslim issue. Don't make it a Palestinian issue. It's an issue about fairness in the university, the right to hear all sides. And that's a way to attract non-Muslim and non-Arab students, to make it an issue of academic freedom, hearing all sides, and just fairness. I'm not trying to suppress, I'm not calling for a boycott, I'm just saying, let's be fair. I think you can win over enough people that the professor will feel a kind of obligation not that he or she wants to, but will feel the pressure of inviting somebody from Gaza. And then you can speak to me and I'll find you a good Gaza, a smart one. I think we can have uh, one or two questions. An article called uh, Mossad Ran 9-11 Arab Hijacker Terrorist Operation. And uh, this was a letter or report released uh, through WikiLeaks uh, of some mails that have been gotten from uh, one of the security firms in the United States. Um, and it claimed basically that the Mossad was supervising this 9-11 uh, operation and uh, maybe even helping it. Uh, which I, after some thought, came to the conclusion was probably true because the uh, group involved in that operation <clears throat> attempted to shoot down a, a, a jet leaving Kenya loaded with uh, Israeli tourists. And it seems like after that the Mossad must have been on the uh, job to <coughs> supervise uh, bin Laden and his crowd uh, in case of future. What is the question? Well, the question is, is this uh, anything you've heard about and do you think it's credible? I don't think any of this is credible. I think it's complete nonsense. And as I... As I said to several of the young people I was speaking to this morning, when you make statements that lack any kind of factual foundation, you may think you're discrediting, say, Israel by saying it was behind 9-11, or discrediting Jews by saying the Nazi Holocaust didn't happen. But all you end up doing is discrediting yourself. People look at you and think you're an imbecile. That you're backward. That you're stupid. The Muslims are not stupid. To say they are is stupid. You were very impressive academically. There's no question in my mind about that. The fact of the matter is, in one particular field of intellectual inquiry, Muslims are much more impressive than Westerners. They're much, Muslim women are much better in math than Western women. That happens to be a fact. If you look at, for example, in Iran, 
in, in the higher reaches of mathematics. 60% of the advanced students, advanced degree, are Muslim women. That's absolutely unheard of anywhere in the West. If you ask Muslim women, are you afraid of math? I've never met a Muslim woman who's afraid of math. That's very common among Western women. They perform much below Muslim women. It's a, a fact that the top math medal in the world is the Fields Medal. And the first woman to win it uh, was an Iranian woman. She won it two or three years ago. She passed away from breath, breast cancer at a very young age, 40 years. But you have, you know, very impressive. Our Muslim students are always good. Even the bad Muslim, my bad Muslim students are still good. <laughs> no, I mean it. They surprise me. Sometimes they become very Americanized and to the point that they look like they're dumb. But no, actually they're not. But what you do when you say things like, uh, you know, the Zionists were behind 9-11 or the Nazi Holocaust didn't happen, you end up making yourself look stupid. And that's, you should remember that. It's not like you're discrediting Israel or Jews, you end up discrediting yourself. And that's the sad part of it, because there's no lack of intelligence among Muslims. That's just, it's, it's ridiculous. You perform, I, I, the Muslim students uh, perform very well. They're extremely respectful when they're in school, which I, I kind of like. Uh, they're very respectful, very serious, very good students, and the women are uh, as a whole. I have my own theory about that, by the way. Why are Islamic women so good in math? Because Islamic fathers, they say to their children, I don't care if you're a girl or a boy, you're going to be a civil engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Not giving you a choice. They want you to excel, or, you know, or uh, IT nowadays. And so, the father's confidence in you gave you the confidence to do well in that. Are you a good math student? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You? Yeah. No? <laughs> Unusual. You? Unusual. <laughs> you? No. No? <laughs> this is a surprising one. How about you? You're good. And you don't have any fear of math. And if you walked into a class and all the other students were boys, that wouldn't intimidate you. No. That's pretty typical. And you? Yeah. Which is unusual. You know, and uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's something to be admired. You know, and that's another thing, you know, they talk about Muslim women being repressed, and, you know, there are a lot of problems with the situation in women in our world, in Muslim world, one shouldn't deny it, but on the other hand, there are also some real achievements, uh, and the fact that uh, Muslim women excel in math and science is actually quite impressive. I don't just know what happened with you, you become too Americanized, and too Westernized. We're just going to have a math test after the event, we just stay. <laughs> I would like to know what your uh, point of view is about the creation of Israel. Because to my, uh, to my knowledge, uh, it was with the help of uh, France and Britain. So I see uh, an illegal political entity in, in Israel. And therefore, I see a natural uh, tension coming from this state because it was not, uh, you know, it was not natural for them to come in this, uh, from this area. So what is your view about the, the creation of this state and, uh, and the legitimacy? I think that there are many aspects to that question. Um, let me try to focus on a few of the aspects uh, related to the language that you use. Now you said it's not natural for the people to be there. So then I would ask, here we have an audience which is largely consisting of Muslims, not a few of them from Iraq, 
I've noticed that I've met a lot of Iraqi. And I have Well, okay, that's fair enough. He wants to clarify his terms because he knew exactly where I was going and he wanted, like in chess, to block me. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, no, that's fair enough. So then I have a question. Uh, the United States was obviously, my, the country I live in, it was created by force. And until the American Revolution in 1776, it was British colonialism that, was, uh, that enabled the creation of the United States. It was a forceful imposition of a European power on the indigenous population. So, my family comes from Poland. And we, my parents came to the United States after World War II. So, by your argument, it's not natural that I'm in the United States because the United States was created by force at the expense of the indigenous population, parts of which were exterminated and parts of it which were expelled from their native homes. And so if I'm going to use your argument about it not being natural for me to be in the U.S. because I'm there by virtue of the forceful imposition of European power on the native population in the U.S., then if I want to be consistent with your argument, I should be packing my bags and moving back to Warsaw, which is where my parents are from. And I'm be, I'll be perfectly frank with you, I'm not prepared to do that. And I don't think I have any kind of, I don't believe I have any kind of moral obligation to do that. Now, you will recall that in the case of South Africa, there were two tendencies within the anti-apartheid movement. One group, the one that's better known, they said, we want equal rights for everyone. The slogan was, one person, one vote. But there was another group which spoke like you. They said, the South African whites, they came over by virtue of force that it's not natural for them to be in South Africa. And that this was the opinion of what was called the Pan-African Congress. Uh, their opinion was all Europeans should go back to Europe. And South Africa should just be for the original South African black population uh, which was here before Europeans, by force, <coughs> imposed their will on the people, the native population of South Africa. Now, many people who support the Palestinians bring up the example of South Africa, but I think it's sometimes forgotten that the South African example at least the one represented by Nelson Mandela, it believed everyone had the right to be there. One person, one vote. It didn't believe it was not natural for the whites who came there by force to stay there. They didn't think that was not natural. 
Well, uh, we're going to stop here, and of course you can, can still just stay. Well, it, 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 just the event is over, but you can you can just stay afterwards, and maybe even have a talk with Norman Finkelstein afterwards. Um, there's going to be a closed session in half an hour if, if anyone is interested in staying, and you can talk to the management of the Danish Islamic Institute if you want to know how to pay and so on. But uh, let's just uh, give a big hand of applause to Norman Finkelstein. to of course the Islamic Institute for making it possible. There is a link on our Facebook so you can go in and click for more information about the VIP.